Hey everyone, this is Alicia Kraus live from the Prager UHQ. And if you're like me, you're counting down the days to the 4th of July, but there's a lot happening in Washington, DC. And we're gonna be talking about that with our next Prager U live guest, one of our favorite presenters ever. But first, I have to ask you, please take a moment and click the link right now and donate as little as $5 makes a big difference to help make sure that Prager U videos and Prager U lives stay free. They are impacting millions of Americans, including the majority of our viewers that are millennials. That means under under the age of 35. So you can make a difference in educating a 35 year old today, a 25 year old today, a 15 year old today. If you're a parent, a grandparent, a single person, whatever, please go right now to PragerU.com and donate or click the link in this PragerU Live. Now, without further ado, I wanna welcome one of my favorite people in the whole world. He's an all around decent dude. Larry Elder is, I guess, are you a thrice presenter to PragerU now? I think so. Wow. That's right. So welcome yeah. to that. We need to have a sweater like SNL gives out to people. I was going to say, I feel like Alec Baldwin on <laughs> SNL. <laughs> He's a five-timer club? I don't remember. I know that The Rock got the five-timer robe, and hey, The Rock can pull off anything. But so can you, dear sir. Larry Elder is also a syndicated radio host and columnist, best-selling author, and a friend of PragerU and of Dennis. And Larry, I loved your video this week. And so yeah. tell me, what was it, what, what kind of triggered the thought process of, I'm going to talk about how JFK, would he be a Democrat or Republican in 2017? Well, it's a couple of things. I've always been fascinated by JFK. Ever since I was a kid, he was, uh, I think I was 11 years old when he was killed. And my mother was a big fan of his. My father voted for Richard Nixon. So there was always this kind of tension in the House around Democrat versus Republican uh, that always fascinated me. But more importantly, uh, I feel that the Democratic Party has gotten way left from its roots uh, uh, that that encouraged people like my mother to become a, a Democrat, people like uh, Ronald Reagan to become a Democrat, people like uh, Charlton Heston all left the party. Uh, and Reagan famously said, I didn't leave the Democratic Party, the Democratic Party left me. Mm -hmm. I interviewed Heston a number of times uh, when he was president of the NRA. He said the same thing. And despite the fact, Alicia, that my mother never changed her registration, she voted twice for Reagan and twice for George W. Bush. And I asked her why she wouldn't change her registration, and it was emotional. And that brings me back to Kennedy. This um, this vision that we have of Kennedy uh, is is often a, an emotional one. One because he's such an attractive guy, and because his wife was such an attractive woman. Uh, we forget that when you analyze his policies uh, today, he'd probably be, be called a Republican. Uh, and I would imagine that uh, the people who supported Bernie Sanders and Hillary. Uh, assuming Kennedy would not have evolved, uh, would not have voted for somebody like this. Uh, on on the guns, Democratic, for example. Especially, as you point out in the video, the Democratic Party uses the Kennedy name all the time. And there have he's, been he's other icon. Kennedy politicians that are way further to the left than JFK ever was. That's right. He's an icon of the party. If that's your icon, then why don't you look at your icon's policies and, and, and tell me why you strayed so far from your icon's policies. On guns, he was a hunter, a staunch Second Amendment guy, understood that the Second Amendment conferred an individual right to keep and bear arms, and spoke eloquently about that. Uh, on abortion, abortion was not an issue in the 1960 campaign. Uh, however, his sister was a staunch pro-lifer and activist Eunice, uh, and uh, Kennedy spoke negatively about the Japanese policy of abortion so that they could uh, control their population. I even have a letter that Ted Kennedy wrote to a constituent in 1971 where he abhorred the idea of abortion on demand. So mm -hmm. Kennedy was a Catholic and, and a believing Catholic and, and opposed abortion and did not feel that it was something that government should be involved in. Foreign policy, if you watch his debates in 1960 with Richard Nixon, uh, uh, they were both staunch Cold War warriors, both World War II vets, and with virtually no difference in their in their point of view. If anything, Kennedy was more hawkish than, than Nixon and talked about there being a missile gap. Most people now believe that there wasn't such a gap, but Kennedy used that to argue that Nixon was not strong enough and hawkish enough on, on foreign policy. Uh, and uh, on taxes, of course, Nick, uh, Kennedy uh, proposed a tax cut that went into effect after he died. Uh, and by percentage, it was a much deeper tax cut than anything George W. Bush ever proposed. Hmm. And when you look at the ideology that Kennedy used in um, in explaining why he wanted a tax cut, he sounded like Ronald Reagan. He said, a rising tide lifts all boats, and for every dollar that a job creator saves in taxes, he can put into uh, his work, investment, to save and create a new job. Uh, it sounded like a supply-side guy, even though that term was not in vogue at the time. So. Hmm. For all those reasons, in my view, unless Kennedy dramatically changed his, his point of view, uh, he would have been a Republican. 
So you also point out that in another way he's similar to Ronald Reagan because he had kind of like the trust but verify and strength, you know, showing military strength specifically. He historically had to deal with the Bay of Pigs invasion and the Cuban Missile Crisis. Well, that's right. And and uh, by the way, on those two issues, I once uh, had a, a pretty uh, raucous interview with Chris um, Chris Matthews, who wrote a book about JFK, mm -hmm. and talked about the two major events in JFK's life, or at least the two events that most of us uh, think about, and that is the uh, PT-109 incident and the Cuban Missile Crisis. And in both those cases, uh, you need to put a real asterisk next to, next to his name. The PT-109 was uh, rammed by a Japanese uh, uh, boat, and it was uh, a much larger boat uh, it's the only PT boat in the whole World War II fleet that was rammed, and it was because Kennedy and his crew was negligent. They apparently were, uh, were were sleeping or not paying attention. It should not have happened. Now, he acted courageously after it got got rammed, and mm -hmm. he did rescue uh, some crewmen. But it would not have had to happen if Kennedy had been properly operating his, uh, his boat. Regarding the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis, his Secretary of State, Dean Rusk, urged him not to sit down with Khrushchev to then... Uh, premier of the Soviet Union without any preconditions. Kennedy was so reckless and so confident in his abilities, he did it anyway. Uh, Khrushchev ran all over him, debated him about the merits of communism over capitalism, and Kennedy did not handle himself very well. Uh, Khrushchev sized him up as a rookie, decided to put missiles in Cuba, uh, but for his assessment that Kennedy was weak, he would not have done that, and I agree that Kennedy handled the Cuban Missile Crisis with expert diplomacy, uh, and, and tactically got uh, the, the missiles out without there being a thermonuclear war. But he basically caused the crisis uh, in the first place, not unlike the way he caused the PT-109 uh, daring rescue in the first place. Interesting. So mm -hmm. speaking of international crisis right now, we it seems as if Iran is kind of ramping up. Obviously, Bashar al-Assad in Syria doesn't seem to give a rip about you know committing genocide against his own people. Of course, under the Obama administration, he crossed that red line and nothing was done. The Trump administration did drop those bombs in April, and President Trump recently and Nikki Haley, of course, at the UN have said that they will do something. So it's like you have Iran, Syria, Russia, and then North Korea, of course, with Otto Warmbier, an American being released but unconscious and then dying a week later at right. home. Um, there's lots of international stuff happening right now. What would your advice be to President Trump to make sure that we don't ramp up and have a Cuban Missile Crisis type scenario? Well, so far, I've been impressed. I've been impressed with the team that he has. I've been impressed with uh, with Mad Dog Mattis. I've been impressed with H.R. Uh, McMaster. Uh, and I think today, for example, when uh, or, or yesterday, when the White House uh, issued some sort of release uh, uh, saying that their intelligence suggests that Syria is about ready to release another nuclear attack, that was a shot across the bow. That was telling them, uh, you do that again, uh, and whatever happened last time uh, is going to look like uh, look like a, uh, a, a, a dream, a, a piece of cake. Um, and and if nothing happens, to me, it means that uh, that uh, the Syrians got the message and decided not to do it uh, lest they uh, be uh, be hit again the way Trump hit him a little while ago. Uh, look, we've had eight years of appeasement, eight years of leading from behind, eight years of a president who went into office uh, saying that the Iraq war was a dumb war and pulled every single troop out of Iraq over the objection of his Secretary of State Hillary, over the objection of a CIA head, over the objection of the Secretary of Defense, of uh, the Joint Chiefs, the ambassador uh, to uh, uh, the U.S. ambassador to Iraq, uh, and um, uh, uh, so Obama did it anyway. And Ray Odierno, the former Army uh, member of the Joint Chiefs, said that had they left the stay behind force of so between five and ten thousand. Uh, people, which is roughly roughly what we have right now, as as they creep back, mm -hmm. ISIS could have been dealt could have been dealt with, and ISIS would not have metastasized the way it did. So, uh, my point is, Trump has inherited a mess. It's going to take a long time to undo all this. There's no area of the world that, after eight years of Obama, is better than it was before he took office. So, one of those messes that Trump has inherited and Republicans are trying to deal with right now on the Hill is repeal and replacement of Obamacare. Trump infamously now said a couple of weeks ago that he thought that the House side was too mean in their right. approach and is very involved. As a matter of fact, I think 50 senators are currently meeting at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue with the president to negotiate and discuss what the Senate bill is going to look like. Of course, senators like Cruz, Lee, and Paul, um, along with a couple of others, are allegedly in the no column. What are your thoughts on the Senate version of this bill? Well, I think uh, as a practical matter, as a matter of trying to retain control of the House, uh, the Republicans have to do something. 
Uh, that something will, in the minds of people like Rand Paul, uh, be uh, Obamacare light, and uh, and there's good reason to call it Obamacare light. You mm -hmm. still have a heavy footprint of government involved in it. Uh, and if you're a true free marketer, you're somebody who believes that the federal government ought not be involved in health care whatsoever and that the problem with our health care system is that half our health care dollar is paid for by government via Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, and you have heavy government interference in the other half that is not totally controlled by government. So we have a quasi uh, 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 quasi free market system that, in my opinion, uh, is not nearly as efficient as it would be if it were totally free market. Now, the real world, though, however, is that if you dare to touch Medicare or Medicaid, uh, you're going to get crucified, which is why Donald Trump and Hillary did not mention it virtually any time during the campaign. Hmm. Even Obama said the three major entitlement programs, uh, including Social Security, are unsustainable. Uh, so, um, Whatever the Republicans do will ultimately cost more money. Rand Paul is right. Premiums are not going to go down. Uh, and uh, eventually, uh, when uh, costs go out of control, uh, Congress is going to have to go back to the taxpayers and ask for more money. Uh, and uh, there will be more pressure if, Republican, if Democrats take over for there to be single payer. That's been the, the goal of Democrats all along. Howard Dean publicly said so. Harry Reid publicly said so. That's what they want. Even Obama said when he, before he became president, if he were starting from scratch, he'd have single payer. So that is their goal. And all they're going to do when Republicans pass this is find flaws in it. Uh, they're going to find somebody named Susie who lives in West Cupcake, whose premiums are a little higher than they were before. And they're going to argue that ultimately we, should, we ought to have single payer. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be up the Republicans to push back. So my long answer, short term, we've got to do something long term. I'm hoping that people like uh, Rand Paul and like Ted Cruz will prevail on Donald Trump uh, to get more free market oriented and we get towards a free market system, which is the best way of maximizing accessibility, improving quality uh, and affordability. So I want to tap into your legal mind. I'm sorry I was remiss to mention that, of course, you are a brilliant lawyer as well, in addition to all of your other <laughs> I'm, jobs. I'm a lawyer. You have. <laughs> I'm a lawyer. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know people <clears throat> watching that don't like lawyers are like, there's no such thing as a brilliant lawyer. Um, so yeah. I want to talk to you about, we learned this week some of the uh, some of the cases that the Supreme Court will be taking up when they you know, go back to work in October. And I wanted to get your humble opinion on which of those cases do you think is going to be the most instrumental in the 2018 midterm elections, like used as talking points on the left and the right, and which one you think kind of intrigues you the most? Well, I think the uh, <clears throat> excuse me the, the 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 cases having to do with the travel ban mm -hmm. uh, will probably be cases that will have something to do with the campaign because. Uh, those people who are concerned about our borders, who are concerned about the uh, six countries uh, that are problematic where we cannot uh, vet refugees, are the people that, generally speaking, want secure borders, uh, do not want a pathway to, to citizenship, uh, and uh, want to deal with the violent, criminal, illegal aliens who are here. So you have that that divide. On the other side are people who feel that uh, putting up a wall and, deal and dealing with immigration is harsh and unfair. We ought to have a so-called comprehensive way of dealing with this so a whole bunch of people uh, are given citizenship who don't have it right now so the travel ban issue is a kind of an avatar for that uh, for that deeper issue uh, the other one that's interesting I think is going to be the a uh, man who did not want to bake a cake for a gay wedding mm -hmm. uh, the Supreme Court apparently is going to take that case up uh, and then uh, this of course is a very important religious freedom case uh, so I think those two cases are going to be uh, cases that people are going to be looking at. And I believe that ultimately that the travel ban is going to be upheld. Uh, I said that at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. And in this case, this was a nine to nothing uh, decision to uh, to uh, reverse the temporary restraining order. Uh, three of the judges uh, felt that the initial uh, travel ban without any restrictions should go back to, into effect. So there's no question in my mind that there is a majority of Supreme Court justices, if not all of them, who will ultimately say that what Donald Trump did, however unwise some people think it is, was perfectly legal. So final question, because I know we're running out of time and you have a radio show to do. Uh, what are your thoughts on the rumor mill that we've heard this week that Justice Kennedy might be retiring? Well, usually on the last day of the term, they announce uh, any kinds of retirements, mm -hmm. uh, and he did not. And so what I've heard is that the, whatever rumors did not come from his office, they came from somebody else's office. Frankly, I thought Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Ruth Bader Ginsburg health, her health was more problematic than his health. I've mm -hmm. heard lots of rumors about her health. 
uh, but it doesn't appear that she's retiring anytime soon. She certainly does not want to retire while Donald Trump is president, and if she can hang on until the next election, assuming he does not win, that's the day she's going to retire, if, wow. she's still, if she's still around. I'm sure everyone wishes both of those justices as well, but I'm sure also a lot of conservatives kind of hope they retire to give Donald Chance, Trump right. the chance to nominate we don't, we another. We don't wish anybody ill will, but exactly. Ruth Bader Ginsburg, if you are listening, I understand that the that the weather in the Bahamas is wonderful. <laughs> can't, retire can't so we can nudge. get another couple of Gorsuches in there. Larry, nudge, thank you nudge, so nudge, much nudge. for your time today, and we love having you as a member of the PragerU presenter family. Be sure to tune in tomorrow because we are going to be talking with Alan Dershowitz, and later this week, Dennis has a very special guest on Facebook Live, so be sure to like and share this and donate, folks, so we can help keep our videos free. Thanks so much for tuning in today. I'll see you tomorrow.